In order to build up our intuition about the design space of distributed hash tables, or DHTs for short, let's contrast the design of made-safe routing DHT to the most widely used DHT on the public internet today, namely BitTorrent's mainline DHT, which sports between 10 and 27 million nodes, depending on the time of the day. While the made-safe routing DHT main purpose is to securely route messages between nodes, the main purpose of the BitTorrent mainline DHT is to discover which nodes are providing a particular file. These two different use cases have different requirements, but share many similar implementation IDs. Let's first introduce the problem BitTorrent solves, and we will progressively see how the problems that come from centralization can be solved by using the IDs that have been introduced in the previous videos. BitTorrent solves the problem of distributing content over the internet, from providers to consumers. In the traditional client-server distribution model, the provider of content, such as Joe, is a server of data, and the consumer, such as Bob, is a client to that server. This client-server model underlies much of the web architecture of today. The client program used to access the web is called a web browser and talks to servers located in data centers throughout the globe. In this example, to obtain a copy of the red file, Bob first establishes a connection to Joe and requests the red file through that connection. Joe then sends a copy of the red file over the connection. Now Bob has a copy of the file and all is good. This distribution model is fine as long as the demand for the content requires less resources than what is available from Joe in the form of bandwidth and computing power. Now, let's say not only Bob wants a copy of the file, but also Alice and a whole mob of enthusiasts they will all establish connections to Joe and request the same red file. Joe will then provide the file to Bob and then Alice and then everybody else. In this case, in which the content is really popular, it is possible for Joe's bandwidth and computational power to be insufficient to serve all the demand for the file. It entails that other nodes need to wait to be served the content. It is always possible to provision more capacity on Joe's side by having more servers available to provide the file and load balancing the request among those servers. Most of current web services we use today, whether implemented in private data centers or built using cloud infrastructure, are built along this model. However, fundamentally that means that the infrastructure costs for a provider of content are proportional to the popularity of the content. In some lucrative sectors, that might not be a problem, but there might be other cases in which there's no clear way to monetize the content being distributed, however popular it might be, such as public scientific or governmental data. BitTorrent solves the problem by using a different model that leverages resources and bandwidth, computational power, and storage that are otherwise completely overlooked, those available from the clients connecting to the system. Rather than having all client nodes connecting to a single server, Let's rearrange the nodes to allow them to communicate with one another. To make it easier to visualize, let's put them on a circle. Now that more than one node can serve the content, we need a way to know which node currently provides the content. The simplest way to do it is to introduce an additional kind of node, which is called a tracker, that keeps track of who is currently providing the content. To use our previous example, Joe now has a direct connection to the tracker, who knows Joe is providing the red file. When Bob wants to obtain the red file, he first connects to the tracker and learns Joe is providing the red file. He now establishes a direct connection to Joe to obtain the file. From then on, the distribution of the data is the same. After Bob has obtained a copy of that file, he also tells the tracker node that it can also provide the red file. Later, when Alice wants a copy of the red file, she connects to the tracker node and request information about nodes that are providing the red file. She learns about both Bob and Joe and can decide to connect to either one of them. In this case, she connects to Bob. When another node comes in and is also looking for the red file, it ends up connected to Joe. Now the distribution of the red file can happen simultaneously from both Bob and Joe. Note that in this case, there is still a centralized server node that performs the tracking. However, providing tracking services requires very little resources compared to distributing the files. Therefore, a tracker node can coordinate many nodes. The tracker node can still become a bottleneck or be the target of attacks to disrupt the network. The BitTorrent mainline distributed hash table solves the issue by decentralizing its behavior. 
We have now covered enough material in this series so far to know how to design a decentralized tracker. So let's pause for a few seconds to think about how it can be achieved. So the first step is to assign an identifier to the file, which can be obtained by hashing its content. We then assign IDs to nodes from an ID space with the same range as the ID space for files, and we ensure they are unique for every node. In practice, we can simply pick IDs randomly from a sufficiently large space. Also, we store the tracking information on the node that is closest to the file name in terms of XOR distance. The rest of the protocol is derived from that. Let's now see all the steps required by Alice to obtain the red file. Let's first assume that Alice is already part of the network and knows about some other nodes. Notice here that in contrast to the MadeSafe routing DHD, the links are unidirectional, which means that although Alice might know about some other nodes, such as 9, that node might not know anything about Alice. Alice first sends a message to the network to obtain which nodes are providing the file 14. In BitTorrent parlance, a peer provides a file, or seed, for others to download, while a node participates in the operation of the distributed hash table. The message Alice sends to obtain who is currently providing the file is therefore get peers with the ID of the file, 14, and is sent to other nodes in the network. The same BitTorrent client program performs both the peer role for some file shared by the user while also being a node in the distributed hash table. Alice first sends the get peers 14 message to the closest node to 14 she knows of, which is 13. 13 now checks whether it has any tracking information for the file 14. Since it does not, it returns the closest node it knows of to 14, in this case, 15. Now that Alice knows about a closer node, but still has not obtained the tracking information, she requests tracking information from 15. Since 15 has tracking information for that file, it returns all the peers it knows of who are providing the file. In this case, Joe with the ID 4, as well as the information on how to connect to Joe, such as IP address and port number. Alice can now establish a direct connection to Joe and obtain a copy of the red file. After having received its copy, Alice announces to the network that she's also providing a copy of the file 14 for others by sending an announce message to the closest node she found during the discovery phase for the tracker, in this case, 15. 15 then adds Alice to the tracking information, and from now on, others will be able to connect to Alice instead of Joe to obtain the red file. To keep its table of neighboring nodes size manageable, Alice will eventually remove some of the temporary nodes she learned of, such as 15. Let's now see how Alice might have joined the distributed hash table in the first place. So Alice knew beforehand about Bob, an existing node already part of the network, which we previously called the bootstrap node. Alice picked an ID at random, which now puts her inside the network, but no other nodes in the network knows about her. So to learn about other nodes and advertise herself to the network, Alice finds the closest nodes to herself by performing a lookup for her own ID amongst other nodes. Note that in this case, Alice sends a get nodes 11 rather than a get peers 11, since she's only interested in learning about other nodes, not getting tracking information about a specific file. Alice sends the message to the closest node to herself she knows of, Bob. Through that request, Bob learns about the existence of Alice and adds her in its table of neighbors. Had the corresponding K bucket been full, Bob could have ignored her, but since it was not, he added her. Bob then examined the request and realized he is indeed the closest node to Alice and therefore returns himself as the closest node. From Bob's answer, Alice now knows he is the closest to herself and stops looking for other nodes. Later on, while performing other regular operations, such as finding the tracking information for some files, Alice will learn about other nodes in the network and will update its table of neighbors. We therefore see here that the discovering of neighboring nodes piggybacks on regular operations of the distributed hash table, such as finding the tracking information for a particular file. That property is inherited from the original Cadenia design. To wrap up, the BitTorrent mainline DHT is different from MadeSafe routing DHT because it uses unidirectional links between nodes and implements different protocols tailored to discovering tracking information rather than securely routing messages. However, 
Even though the use cases are very different, both distributed hash tables use a uniform ID space to name files and machines, use a notion of closeness based on the bitwise exclusive or distance to perform operations, and use key buckets to decide which nodes to include in the neighbor's table. Similar ideas can therefore be used to build a centralized system for different purposes.